You're listening to Shakespeare's Sonnets Exposed, episode 28, sonnet 27. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What if I say I'm not just another no. one in your place? You're, You're the, the pretender. pretender. What if I say I will never surrender? I was very excited to publish page three of the graphic novel this week and subsequently very disappointed to realize just how much difficulty is imposed by there being nudity on the page, especially considering that my ultimate goal is to get this work into the hands of younger readers. So this has been a painful lesson, but the universe has spoken, and I have listened. I have already discussed viable alternatives with the illustrator, and it seems like we have a good strategy moving forward. Unfortunately, that'll mean a redo of a fair chunk of page three, but I guess that's an improvement over discovering these obstacles later on and having to redo both pages three and four, which were the only two adult theme pages out of 67 that were scheduled for the first issue. On a related note, for those of you who are fans of Game of Thrones or A Song of Ice and Fire, hunting through Ovid's Metamorphoses for potential references from the sonnets has convinced me that George R. R. Martin leaned quite heavily on it. So if you needed one more reason to familiarize yourself with its stories, then there you go. I found a podcast retelling of Ovid's Metamorphoses as well, for which you'll find a link in the description. Once again, I'd like to thank my patrons for their contributions, and as importantly, for showing faith in a project that I've been obsessed with and possessed by for years. If you haven't already, then please sign up to support the graphic novel adaptation at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Every dollar helps breed a page that brings us closer to a beautiful graphic novel that will make the sonnet so much more accessible. And of course, 10 times that dollar will bring you the finished product 10 times faster. Sonnet 27 Weary with toil, I haste me to my bed, the dear repose for limbs with travail tired. But then begins a journey in my head to work my mind when body's works expired. For then my thoughts from far where I abide intend a zealous pilgrimage to thee and keep my drooping eyelids open wide looking on darkness which the blind do see. Save that my soul's imaginary sight presents their shadow to my sightless view which like a jewel hung in ghastly night makes black night beauteous and her old face new. Lo, thus by day my limbs, by night my mind, for thee and for myself no quiet find. Right, let's analyze Sonnet 27. Weary with toil, I haste me to my bed, the dear repose for limbs with travail tired, but then begins a journey in my head to work my mind when body's works expired. Weary meant tired, exhausted, miserable, and sad. Toil was hard work, originally turmoil, contention, or dispute from Anglo-French. In the 1590s, the word meant hard work and labor, and hunting net, cloth, and web from Old French, effectively cloth or canvas, recalling Sonnet 26's clothing and tailoring theme. Bed is a word that has not evolved much since its Old English origins, and meant bed, couch, resting place, garden plot. Dear meant precious, valuable, costly, expensive, glorious, noble, loved, beloved, and regarded with affection. Repose meant to lie at rest, but also put back, set back, replace, restore, put away, lay out, and stretch out. Limb meant part or member, or limb of the body, any part of an animal body distinct from the head and trunk, but also edge of a quadrant or other instrument tying into the astronomy and nautical themes. Travail, which is sometimes modernized to travel, meant both travel and work, both from the French. With these additional meanings explored, we can see that bed could be both a bed, a resting place, and a grave, a final resting place. If the sonnets are the limbs, then Shakespeare was the head, and his death would be the costly price of their work being complete. The letter J is a surprisingly rare letter in the sonnets, 
and until Sonnet 27 I hadn't noticed that it's printed as an I in the original quarto text. Without further study I'm not convinced that this is always meaningful, but here in Sonnet 27 I do believe that Shakespeare has infused this letter with intention. Journey, or irony, here, is the journey that his eyes, the sonnets, are making, and later in the sonnet we see the word jewel, or eyewell, after eyelids, and I suspect that in addition to being a metaphor for a star, it is describing the sonnet sequence as a well of eyes, referencing the well or spring in which Narcissus sees himself. Weary with toil means the same as travail tired. Journey meant a defined course of traveling, one's path in life, from old French journée, a day's length, day's work, or travel. Head contrasts with limbs. Expired meant died, but also breathed out, and as of the 1580s, also included the sense of a law or contract expiring. The first quatrain can now be read in two ways. The first being that when Shakespeare is tired from his day's labor and goes to bed, his mind races and his night labor dreaming of his legacy begins. In the second reading, when Shakespeare is laid to rest after a life of labor, his works, in particular the sonnets, will begin their journey into the future to be breathed out or read out loud by the reader on his behalf. For then my thoughts from far where I abide in tender zealous pilgrimage to thee, and keep my drooping eyelids open wide, looking on darkness which the blind do see. As I discussed early on in this podcast, each sonnet is a thought or reflection, and the sonnet sequence is the embodiment of Shakespeare's thoughts that will outlive his physical body. Abide originated as remain, wait, wait for, delay, remain behind and was understood to mean endure, sustain, stay firm under, and also tolerate, bear, put up with. Shakespeare's enduring spirit abides in the text of his sonnets, which will travel far and wait lifetimes to reach their intended audience. Zealous meant full of zeal, usually in the service of a person or a cause, but with a sense fervent or inspired. The sonnets are inspired by Shakespeare to make pilgrimage to you, the reader, bearing his thoughts and spirit. This ties in with the conceit of the faithful ambassadors from Sonnet 26. Droop meant to sink or hang down, to be downcast or sad. Eyelids, in the original quarto text, is hyphenated, which indicates that it can be read both as the single word eyelids or as a conflation of eye and lids, in the sense that what is drooping are both eyes and lids. With this in mind, we can make a case for the drooping eyelids being the sonnets, each one serving both as an eye of Shakespeare and as the lid of a sonnet treasure store in which his thoughts have been buried. We can read line sevens and keep my drooping eyelids open wide in two ways. If Shakespeare has merely gone to bed, then his thoughts will keep him awake with his eyes staring into the impenetrable darkness of the night. If he has died, then his sonnets will serve as his eyes to the living world, and while writing the sonnets, he imagines his buried body's eyes open in the darkness of the grave, seeing the same darkness that the blind sonnets see when the book is closed. We can also read line 8, looking on darkness which the blind do see, as referring to the readers as blind, in that they can only see the darkness of the sonnet's text, but not the poet living behind it. Save that my soul's imaginary sight presents their shadow to my sightless view, which, like a jewel hung in ghastly night, makes black night beauteous and her old face new. While sightless view probably meant the same as we understand it today, view derived from Old French and meant light, brightness, look, appearance, eyesight, or vision. So, sightless view could also be read as an oxymoron. Shadow meant darkened area created by shadows or shade. From the early 13th century it carried a sense of anything unreal, but evolved to a ghost and then a foreshadowing or prefiguration. By Shakespeare's day it bore the sense of the faintest trace as well. 
My soul's imaginary sight can be read in two ways. The first with the S of souls as indicating possession, and the second as suggesting multiple souls. Considering the presence of the word there in line 10, which some argue is a mistake, I am of the opinion that the intention here is that the imaginary sight is that of the sonnets, and that it could mean what the sonnets see, but also what can be seen in the sonnets. And the sonnets present their shadow, Shakespeare, to the reader, just as they present the reader's shadows back to the imagination of the bard while he is still alive and writing. Ghastly meant inspiring fear or terror, hideous or shocking. Jewel, as stated before, appears to work both as jewel and as eye well. It meant precious stone or gem, as well as beloved person or admired woman. The third quatrain presents a counterpoint to the second. Shakespeare, in the previous quatrain, will be faced with impenetrable darkness, unless that which is seen through the eyes of the sonnet sequence appears in his mind's eye while he lies dreaming, or to his ever-living soul after it has departed his body. Visions of the reader seen through the eyes of the sonnets will appear as jewels, or eye wells, sparkling in the terrifying darkness of eternity, flashes of light on open pages making the eternal, ancient night seem beautiful and youthful by contrast. Lo, thus by day my limbs, by night my mind, for thee and for myself no quiet find. Quiet meant inactivity, rest, or repose. The closing couplet of Sonnet 27 expresses the idea that Shakespeare, whether by working with his hands or by working with his mind, can get no rest, day or night. It's interesting that he includes the, which could be either the sonnets or the reader. The sonnets do Shakespeare's work during the day, whenever there's light on the open page, and at night they wonder and wonder in search of new readers. The reader, who has let the sonnets plant their seeds in their mind, might expect to be kept up at night considering the sonnets' messages, but it is more likely that the intention here is that Shakespeare's sonnets do not want to be met with silence, and Shakespeare was working around the clock to ensure that the readers of the sonnets would feel compelled to read the sonnets out loud. While the sonnets have been recognized and adored by scholars and fans the world over, they haven't enjoyed the same kind of mass appeal as his plays, and Shakespeare's intention for his works was always to appeal to a broad cross-section of society. It is my aim to rescue the sonnets from obscurity, from the darkness, and to that end I am producing a graphic novel adaptation, recording this podcast, converting these podcast episodes into a book, and tattooing 154 images representing the sonnets onto my body. Once again, I need your help to make this happen. Please consider signing up to support this project at www.patreon.com slash fisherking. Keep up with the graphic novel progress at sonnetcomics.com and join our community discussions on Reddit at slash r slash sonnetcomics with an X. Thanks for listening. What if I say I'm not, not like, like the others? others? What, what if I say, say I'm not, not just another one in your place? place? You're the pretender, what if I say I will never surrender?